happy Pentecost Sunday. Um, will you just join me in prayer before we go into a time of worship? Uh, Lord, we thank you. Uh, we thank you for a day where we, we stop and we think about the best day ever when you poured out your spirit on all flesh. And uh, we thank you for your work that prepared us, that accomplished the ability to receive you in that great outpouring. And this morning, Lord, we ask that you would receive this offering of worship um, that we bring into the courts. And we praise you, Father. We praise you, Jesus. And Holy Spirit, we praise you. Amen. Hallelujah, fear you lost your hold on me. 
Spirit. We just invite your presence here. As we celebrate Pentecost, we ask you for a fresh outpouring, a fresh anointing, a fresh infilling. As we lift the name of Jesus, we pray that you would draw all men to yourself.
Okay, open up your Bibles to John 16. Um, it's going to take me a minute to get there, uh, but open up there. We'll, we'll just kind of see what the Lord wants to do today. Let's see what happens. Um, I'm going to begin by talking about something that I talked about last week, but I'm, I'm deeply convicted that I did not do it justice. And um, I feel like it's important to the Lord, and He, he wants me to make sure that you get this. So for just a moment, you know, we're going to talk about fasting and I'm going to, I'm going to tell you again, I believe we're doing that, uh, right now in this crazy world season, what's going on in the world, what's, what it's, what's happening in his church. I believe he's shown me that it is a fast and I want to, um, this is going to lead us where we're going, but I, I want to tell you what I believe he's shown me, um, is going on right now. Um, do you know any fast is a stripping away of of things of of barriers that are in the way to his presence and the blessing he wants to give now listen to me every fast um and I, look, I'm not talking about the religious thing. Those are great too. Spiritual disciplines are great. They position. And you read all through the Old Testament, there are, there are fasts. Um, you know, they fast regularly on a regular schedule. But throughout the scriptures, and I can give you testimony from my own life, from, from Christian history, from my own life, the Lord institutes fasts that are in spirit and in truth. Okay, we're in one of those. Every fast is to bring us into deeper promise. Okay, the reason that we fast um, is not just because the Lord wants us to go through hard times or, or have things stripped off for no reason whatsoever. Every fast is because we are a people of promise and the Lord is always bringing us into deeper promise and it is fasting that gets us there, okay? Now, here I'm going to say it. I believe to the bottom of my heart, okay? You can choose to join. Um, I believe that the Lord has instituted a fast that we're in right now, and he has stripped off religious facilitators for our faith. We're at least doing them differently, okay? And some of them are completely stripped, stripped away. Now, let me tell you what happens. And I believe I said this last week, but I really want to emphasize because I believe it's, it's a word from the Lord. Um, he's stripped off religious facilitators because what inevitably happens when the Lord does that is that the inner kingdom is developed. Okay. The things that give us comfort in our faith and allow us to cruise when the Lord removes them he positions us for, for deeper intimacy, for development of an inner kingdom, for the real genuine thing. You understand the Lord does not make us go through hard times, tough times, losses, um, the, the pruning. I believe we talked about that last week. He doesn't take us through those things without purpose. He's good. His purpose is always to bring us into, into where he's taking us, into the promise that he's taking us into. So look, I'm not saying we celebrate disease or pandemic or the fact that so far we're still working out, meeting in person under current restrictions. We don't celebrate that. But I want to tell you, there's an aspect where we, we do celebrate the fact that the Lord is moving, that he's in this, and it is for deeper promise because we're a people of promise. I am completely convinced that, um, that if the Lord poured out the Spirit in the measure that we are asking for, that we ask for, um, we would not have the time, the motivation, the spiritual courage, we would probably be crushed under what we're asking for. 
The purpose of fasting, okay, now listen, the purpose of fasting is to create space, is to reprioritize, to create space for the promise that the Lord has spoken. What makes a promise? He spoke it. It's to create space for the promise, the fulfillment of what he's spoken that he wants to give. I hope you're with me in, uh, in the hunger, the desire for the for fulfillment of the spoken words of the Lord over the church. I hope you're joining me in that. We're going to talk about that today. Look, we're going to celebrate the Holy Spirit. It's Pentecost Sunday, and um, and we're going to celebrate that. But I have a word on my heart. It's a it's a context word. Um, that, that I believe we need to get we need to get into the context of what Pentecost was. We skip most of it and we jump to the fulfillment of that word. Now, I, I find it really interesting. I don't know if you've noticed this. I think I've mentioned it before. I find it really interesting that um, that we have been fasting. Now listen to me, we've been fasting for almost exactly, if not exactly, maybe I should say exactly the same amount of time that the disciples began a period of fasting of stripping away before the the Pentecost when he poured out his spirit and it was the birth of the spirit-filled church. We've been doing it for about the same amount of time. Now track with me. Their fast began the moment Jesus began to turn from this powerful spirit-filled ministry and he began to change his language. What did he do? He set his face. You read that over and over. He set his face for Jerusalem and the disciples being committed to him saying, where else do we have to go? We're going with him whether they liked it or not. That was truly, that was the beginning of the fast. Then he died, rose from the dead, and we're in this, the series is in this period of the 40 days in which he's appearing to them, speaking to them of the things of the kingdom and training them to, we've been saying this, to, to recognize his presence, have intimacy in it, and be able to receive from him. Now, this um, today, we're going to turn a little bit and we're going to talk about that receiving part and I'm going to just show you some of the things the Lord's burned on my heart going into this Sunday. You know, I really, I really hoped and prayed and I thought this, this is it. This is, this is the Sunday we're, we're going to have an outpouring in this that, um, that, that we've been praying for, that we've been asking for. And I believe the Lord showed me that we're still in this preparation and, um, that's okay. I trust the Lord. I trust his timing, um, we're going to talk about that, okay? Um, here's what I want to tell you, though. I want to connect this to some things that you know before we jump into John here and really get started in the Scripture. Um, you know, fasting is genuine ones, okay? I, I don't mean to minimize that the Lord commanded them in the law, and they had these periods, these moments of fasting. They had those. Okay, and and that was important. But there were genuine fasts throughout the scripture that that were purely the Lord's, where He drove them into the fast. He, he you know, you think of exiles. Um, depending on how this goes, we may read about one of them today. But He He would drive them to exiles. That would effectively be that would be a genuine fast in the spiritual realm for His people. Always because He was bringing them into the deeper promise that he wanted them to have. Do you know um, the Lord is, uh, Lord help me with this. Do you know that your identity as a child of God is to be a, a person of promise? Do you know what that means? In other words, the Lord is fiercely devoted to your destiny. Now listen to me. What's this sounds like new age talk or something. It's not. It was the Lord's first. So so just track with me. It got stolen and taken into into all kind of weird places. You are a person of promise. What does that mean? You're you're the Lord is committed to your destiny. In other words, you were made to be participant in the fulfillment of every word the Lord speaks. Even fresh active ones in your life. You're made for this. You are made to be miserable when you are not participating 
in the coming into, in the fulfillment of promise. Because that's his plan. That's what you're made for. You are literally knit and designed to come into the words of the Lord that have been spoken, into dreams, into promise. So I want to connect this to an Old Testament thing that you know. Um, Do you know that the crossing of the wilderness, the 40 years in the wilderness, is a fast? Why do I say that? He Listen, the Lord takes them out of bondage. Most of you know this story well. They go across the wilderness, and the whole idea is that is it's not that the Lord just enjoys having them in the wilderness. He's not a God of the wilderness. <laughs> he's a God who's in the wilderness, but he's a God of promise. He's a God taking you somewhere. So the entire wilderness crossing is a, fa- is a fast of the Lord, a genuine one that he institutes in the spiritual realm upon people that he wants to bring into the promise. Okay, so they, they go out into the wilderness and they uh and and the whole idea is that the lord fiercely loves them like he loves you and he's preparing to take them in now here's the thing fast is for preparation for the coming promise um notice that i did not say people are prepared in the fast I mean, it's okay. Go ahead and note with me a little bit of reality. An entire generation did die in the wilderness. They failed to be prepared to be receivers of what he was trying to give them. You, you see it instantly when I say it. I know you do. It is the Lord's heart. It is his intention to, to have the fruit of the fast be the receiving of the promise. You were made to receive Okay, but a whole generation died because they were not prepared. Now, why? Let me tell you something. We're going to talk about waiting today, I think. (laughs) We're going to talk about waiting today. We're a people of waiting, and we're going to talk about what that means. Um, But you know, um, you are waiting for something. Let's just put that out there. In other words, you're single-focused, you're hungry, you're desiring for something. In fact, it, it may be many things. You may be bombarded by waiting that you're not even conscious that that's what you wait for. That's what you wake up in the morning and consumes you. Okay, now think of them in the wilderness. And I want to tell you, I want to remind you of something you know. Um, Do you know that waiting is not not worldly disappointment over the current situation or wishing we could have it back like it was? Now, listen to me. I believe I'm speaking a word to you right now. Waiting is not the desire, is not, is not a, a continuous need to have it back the way that it was, which is a lot of what you read, what they did across the wilderness, and they were a generation who did not receive the promise that he wanted to give. Um, we're not those people. We, we are a people of waiting I want to tell you, I know it's a long intro and I just, I just have to do this. I feel like we're turning in a new direction. So we're going to take this time. Um, I want to give you an example, okay, of, um, I want to give you an example of the, of the way of the Lord in fasting, okay? Um, something that he put strongly on my mind. Um, do you know that the Lord will consistently crush anything that's counterfeit. And when I say that, um, I mean that in the nicest way. Be encouraged. Encourage yourself in the Lord. <laughs> but anything that is counterfeit, genuine kingdom, genuine presence, genuine connecting. Now, let me give you an example, okay? Um on Pentecost and other times throughout Acts after Pentecost, but, but even on Pentecost, it says they were, they were gathered in one accord. You hear these words, one accord, one accord. Now, I'm going to tell you something. If there is counterfeit being gathered in one accord, the Lord will execute a fast. He keeps saying they were of one, one accord and he crushed it. And you see this throughout the scriptures. You see him crush counterfeit kingdom. Why does he do that? Why does he do that for us, upon us, to us? Why does he crush anything counterfeit? It's because he's good. It's because he plans to fulfill your destiny. And for all who, in, who will engage the fast, he is bringing that people into the promise. 
Some went in. Joshua, Caleb, they went in. They participated in the fast. They weren't hungry for the way that it was. I hope I'm doing a good job here. I hope you're tracking with me. Um, we'll we'll kind of jump in now. I'll just say one more thing. Um, one of the things that's been a little bit disturbing to me as of late, just the last couple of weeks, is I'm getting more, cons- you know, people reach out to me sometimes. They, they want to connect and ask questions about the church, and I get that. I love that. That shows hunger, okay? It shows that you care where your focus is, but it concerns me that I'm getting more queries about when we're going to begin some of the religious things that are normal for us than I do get testimonies of the one of the fruit that's being produced in this fast on the church that the Lord is executing. Now, don't get me wrong. I talked to uh, our worship team, for example, and you talk about some people who are people of waiting. Um, they, they really only have one concern. They convict me deeply every time I talk to them. They are deeply hungry. They are, they are actively waiting for the next outpouring of presence, for the deeper promise that the Lord's bringing us into. And it's, and it's amazing. Um, okay, I, I think a long time ago I told you to turn to John 16. Um, thanks for hanging out um, with me and waiting. I think I get to do that. Um, <laughs> I get to take as long as I want to get there to it. But um, let's start reading. I'm in, um, I'm going to start in verse 5. Okay, and I'm just going to start reading here. Now we're, now we're getting into celebration of the Holy Spirit, but, but put your seatbelt on. We're going somewhere. Um, you got to kind of brace yourself for this. Verse 5 says, But now I go away to him who sent me, Jesus speaking, and none of you ask me where are you going. But because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Verse 7, now here it is. Here's why we're reading this. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, um, in, this ver- in the New King James Version, the helper, which is Pericl- Pericletos, will not come to you, but if I depart, I'll send him to you. Now listen. Listen. This is what this is what we've got to get, and this was uh, the Lord almost broke me over this preparing this message. Um, this is um, <laughs> this is the context, their current context, and the one we still read for Pentecost when the Spirit when they were of one accord and the Spirit came upon them. Okay, it's context. What's the context? The context is the Lord speaks. Now, now listen to me. What makes something promise? Do you, do you know what makes a promise a promise? The Lord speaks it. Do you got it? That, that's what makes it a promise. He spoke it, and so therefore it's done. You know that the moment the Lord speaks something, um, it is done. Now, I want to show you something else before, before I even move on to the real point here. Um, here, we're, I understand that, that what I'm reading, this is the printed word that you have in your Bible. You can follow along because it's the printed word of God, okay? But now listen to me. They are recording the rhema word of God. This was Jesus speaking rhema word, the fresh breathed word of God. For them, for their day, is what we're reading recorded. So while it's printed, it's the rhema word of God for them in this moment. Jesus is speaking promise about this coming day of Pentecost. That's what we're reading about. And, and I, just have to, I just have to go back for one moment. Notice, you are a person of destiny. Listen to me. When the church begins to cruise... When we as the church begin to cruise along and we're, we're not a people filled with promise, filled with the fact that the Lord has spoken things that I have not fully seen the fulfillment of yet. That means we are a people that are waiting for the fulfillment of that promise. Now, I want to tell you, he's speaking into your life like that all the time. You, the, the, the active, the spirit-breathed word of God is, is, um, 
is flowing from the courts of heaven into your life all the time. Notice I didn't say that you're aware of it all the time or you're in touch with it all the time. Um, that's on us. But but the Lord, the, the breathed life of Jesus is being given through the Holy Spirit all the time. In fact, I'm going to read that. Continue on. I might have skipped a little and that's okay. Continue on to verse 12. And it says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Now listen, why can they not bear them now? I'm going to tell you why. The Spirit had not been given. These are words, you know, the fulfillment, the bearing, the bearing of the Word of God, the, this fulfillment that comes into our life is only granted by the Spirit. Jesus said, my words are life and Spirit. They are Spirit and they are life. Okay? In other words, they're active, they're fresh breathed, they have power in them for the fulfillment of the promise spoken. So he says, you cannot bear them now. Now let's read on. It says, however, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. Do you know that the Lord wants you to know things to come? Why? That's the fast. Okay, he's training, he is, he is preparing us to be a people that can participate in, can partake in, in the promise that he is fulfilling as he speaks the words. Okay, I'm going to read on here in verse 14. It says, he will glorify me for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. Now think about what he's reading. The words of Jesus are promise. He created the universe by spoken word. He's speaking destiny. What's your destiny? Do you remember it? To be partaker of the fulfillment of his words. Your destiny is to walk into the promises of God. That's at the core of your identity. It's what you're made for. And here it says that this, the role of the Holy Spirit in, in our life, why it's so, why, why the celebration today is so great, why it's so critical that the Spirit was poured out on all flesh is because it makes us people who can bear the weight of his words. Who, what's bear it? Who can be the people who walk into that promise. <clears throat> You know, um, let's say it like this. I believe there are some things of the kingdom, church, that we can only walk into. It is reserved only for those who are waiting for it. Now, why is that? What did it just say? I have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. What's he talking about? I'll tell you something. Um, we've talked about this in this church a lot. You are a people who are going from glory to glory, right? One weight of glory to a greater weight of glory. Now, I want to tell you, the scriptures are full of the truth of the pattern that it is those people who are waiting for the next weight of glory that are being prepared for that glory to be poured out. Okay, crew, um, I'll, I'll leave that alone for now. I'll leave that alone. I want to tell you about the word waiting, and then we're going to go read some things. Do you know there are two words for waiting? Okay. Um, well, and the reason I say two is because one's Old Testament and one's New Testament. Now, the same concept. God does not change two different languages, Hebrew, Greek. You know, the Greek word for waiting um, really really does mean to tarry or to wait, okay? But it has in it, um, actually, let me, let me find this so I get this right. Waiting. It has in it to accept from some source. So to accept, like open your hands like this. Waiting is to accept from a source, and to wait on it. In other words, listen to me, this is so important. Waiting is, I have already accepted it. Why? Because you've spoken it. Okay? I already accepted as done. The, that's promise. Okay? <laughs> the promise is mine. I accept it. And so now I wait on it. What does waiting mean? So now, now I wait around. Let's wait on it. It is not that. And I'm going to show you. Actually, I can show you by just telling you about the Old Testament word wait. And I may or may not need my notes for this. So let me see. 
find this quickly. I have way too many notes again. Just, it happens. Okay, the Old Testament word for wait. Now, you can't make this up, and I've got such good stuff here. You cannot make this up. The Old Testament word for wait has several definitions, and, and they would have understood the word as like, like all together. Are you tracking with me? They wouldn't like separate it out. But in order to get there, let's do this. The first de- definition for, for, the word, um, for the word weight is to twist or whirl in a, in a circular or spiral manner, almost like violently twisting and whirling. Now, I hope you're thinking of all kinds of scriptures with the word wait in it. For time's sake, I'm not going to go to them all, but you think of, think of David saying, I wait on you, Lord. My soul waits on the Lord. You got it? Can you imagine a soul that is twisting and whirling <laughs> over this waiting? Okay, the, the second part of this definition is um, to writhe in pain. Now, s- seriously, it's... It's in the definition to writhe in pain, and it, and it says especially of um, of parturition, which is what is that? You know what that is? That's the act or process of giving birth to offspring. So like that, that's waiting. So look, waiting is um, is. I already received from the source why you've spoken it. This is promise. We're a people of promise. It is my destiny. <laughs> to walk into your promise. So I receive that promise <clears throat> that I have yet to see the fulfillment of the word of the king of this kingdom, the full fullness of what he wants to give to me. Why? Because he's crazy about me, because he loves me. So I receive that and I whirl, I writhe. Waiting is a writhing in pain until the day of its fulfillment. The next outpouring, the next weight of glory. What do you wait for? <laughs> what do we wait for? Now, listen, I want to give you, um, okay, I'm, I'm totally, bl- I only skipped like, like 14 <laughs> pages here, but I feel like we should just continue right here. So this is what we're going to do. Start turning to a Isaiah 54 with me, okay? And um, I asked the Lord, <coughs> I asked the Lord for an example. I, I often do. I pray for that in these messages, an example from my life, things like that. <clears throat> and he didn't give one, okay, not from my life. So I'm going through the scriptures. I'm letting the Lord lead me through the scriptures in this preparation. And he gave me this example that I asked for. Instead of it being like a story or something from my life, he gave me this scripture. This is an example of waiting, Okay, and now let me tell you, let me stop for a minute. Why am I doing this? I believe what we do is we we so often get focused on Pentecost or the outpouring of the Spirit or the baptism of the Spirit. Um, We read the Pentecost story and we are not in touch with the context of the story. We don't understand we don't understand the waiting the active waiting that brings about where the Lord says, this will not crush you. This is, I've prepared you to be one who can bear the weight of the promise that I want to give you. Now you're ready. I can pour that out on you. We are, we are so out of touch with their context of waiting that brought about the fulfillment of the Pentecost, the birth of the spirit filled church. Okay. So This is context. It is in that that I bring this word, okay? Isaiah 54, I'm starting right in verse 1. Now read with me. Um, It says, Sing, O barren, you who have not born. In other words, you you who have not given birth. Sing, O barren. Sing. It goes on and says, Break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not labored with child. Help me with this, Lord. Now, now listen to what you just wrote. We're going to read on a little bit, but now listen, listen to what we just read. This is asking for something that's ridiculous unless you understand spiritual reality and you know the Lord. 
What's this thing? This is a little bit like whirling, dancing, as you writhe in pain in your waiting for the promise to be fulfilled. Look, this is talking about the barren, those, those who did not birth. And, and the word from the Lord here through, through the prophet Isaiah is break forth into singing. He's saying, sing while you're barren. Why? Because I have already received the promise from the source. It doesn't make sense in these circumstances, but the word of my Lord is good. Circumstances, the, the circumstances of this falling world lie, they dash the word of the Lord. But we are a people of promise. It is our destiny to walk into it. His way, his time, because he's the king. And this says, sing while you're without children. Now, now listen to this. This, this goes on. This gets deeper as we go. It goes and says, for more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman, says the Lord. Listen, here's now verse two. Listen carefully. Enlarge the place of your tent and let them stretch out the curtain of your dwellings. Do not spare. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. <laughs> What's going on here? I want to tell you something. This is the definition of waiting. We're reading it. People, we are people who wait. The children of God are people who wait because our God is good for the promise. So listen, what's, what's going on? I'm just going to read that again a little, little by little. Enlarge the place of your tent. In other words, what's that saying? He's asking them to do something ridiculous. The word from the Lord is to prepare your house for the promise as if you already have it. He's telling this to the barren. He's telling this to the ones who have nothing but promise. And he's saying, prepare the house for the promise to come. He's saying, um, enlarge the tent. Well, um, this would have made sense. They lived in tents, okay? <laughs> so they oftentimes, and as they journeyed, and as they came across the wilderness, they would understand these words. Stretch out the curtains, lengthen the cords. In other words, what? Make the house bigger because the Lord speaks fruitfulness and promise. <laughs> Do you got it? It's, I know that we're not seeing that fruit right at the moment, but here's the thing. The Lord says, I speak the promise of the outpouring of my spirit. Prepare, prepare the house for it. Lengthen out the cords. Make the space. Be pre let me prepare you for the weight of the glory that I want to give you. That's an active thing. It's a very active thing. It goes on and says, and, and strengthen your stakes. In other words, make, make the found stakes are really kind of the foundation of a tent. Okay, so you could think about the foundation of your house or the foundation of a building. Okay, this is, this is strengthen the foundation because there's, there's a weight coming. There's a fruitfulness. I am the God of promise and I made you to be people of destiny. When, when we are cruising and we quit dreaming about the next outpouring of the Lord, when we quit writhing in pain because I am never satisfied by the measure of the Lord that I have, I am always... Our God is always a promise that's bringing us into greater measure. He's an increaser, not a decreaser, not, not a stayer the samer. <laughs> Fast is not for a stayer the samer. Fast, the, what the Lord does is prepare the heart, prepare, prepare the house, his bride, the church, to prepare for a level of promise that if he poured out on you right now, it would crush you. It would crush us. Because he is a God, he's a good God. He prepares us for the weight of glory, for the promise, what he's spoken, what we've already received. He prepares his people to handle that, that weight of glory. You see, what does he say? There are many, there are many things I want to say to you, but you can't bear them now. Now think about this with me, church. Why does he say that? Because when he speaks it, it's so. There is a journey, there is a process of walking into its fulfillment. Rarely comfortable, probably never comfortable, usually painful. There's a writhing in pain. There's a twirling of dance in the soul that says, I receive from the source. I'm going there. Why? Because my God's that faithful. Because he's that good. But this is an active thing. This is, in other words, what does he tell you to do? He tells us, act like crazy people. 
<laughs> begin to prepare. What, what am I saying? Begin to prepare your life. Believe me, when the Lord pours out the next weight of glory, you better have space in your life for it. <laughs> you better not have, you, listen, you better not have competing priorities. I'm convicted while I say the words with you, okay? You don't have to be mad at me. I stand here convicted. I want to become a man. <clears throat> And I want us to become the church that have space for the weight of glory that he wants to pour out. Stretch out the curtains, lengthen the cords, because the work he's good for his word over the church. It's okay. I'll cry, you laugh. Hopefully someone's twirling and singing. <laughs> My prayer is that there are a couple of you there that are writhing in pain as I'm talking because you know this longing for the next pouring of glory. And then promise. Now, this, oh, we should read the promise. <clears throat> Pull it together, man. Um, verse 3, For you shall expand to the right and to the left, and your descendants will inherit the nations and make the desolate cities inhabited. Now, of course, it reads on. But I just want to show you how the Lord calls forth the fruitfulness of the future. It's in the fast. Now listen, if you're more concerned with some date of, of in person, trust me, we're working hard on it. We're returning in person. But I believe I have a prophetic word this morning. I'm just going to say it. I believe he has a fat. He is executing because he loves us so much. He's executing a fast. And he is preparing his bride for the next weight of glory. Not all will go. Some are more concerned about having it back the way it used to be. Others are more concerned about the trials, challenges you're going through. Um, you know, it's okay. Let, let me just say this. It's okay to desire to have some of the things back the way they were. Why do I say that? Um, it does show a hunger. You, you know where the goodness is. Okay, and that's fine. I just, I just... Take this as an invitation. I know that I know that the Lord is preparing his bride. Why do I know that? It's, it's um, printed in the Bible. It's not a big secret, but I also know that this is a powerful season right now. He's, he is um, transforming the church. He's stripping off some of the cruising, some of the religious things. You know, I think our culture has an addiction to the service. I said it. It's okay. I'm okay. I'm big enough guy that you can be mad at me if you want. I think we have an addiction to the weekly oration around the nation. <laughs> thousands and thousands of teachers around the nation provide the weekly. And, and look, that's fine. The Lord uses this for a season, and, and he's going to keep using this, okay? I'm just telling you when we're addicted to that, and, and it is not inspiring the twirling of the soul, the... Um, the writhing in pain for the actual outpouring of a deeper and greater presence of the Lord, a weight of glory that goes beyond what we're offering to the world at the moment, then it's just, it's just a religious motion. I said it. There I said it. <laughs> Please don't bomb my email with hate mail. <laughs> I went and said it. Where do you want to go, Lord, now? Where do you want to go? You know what I want to show you? This is totally, um, I thought this would be next week, but, um, I sense this maybe, maybe if I can find it, we'll do this. I should use smaller print, get it all on one page. You know, which one is this? Just just give me a moment to pull myself together. <laughs> yeah, you know what? We're going to do this. I want to show you a guy who waits. Let me clean up this mess. Um, turn with me to Luke chapter 2 and verse 25. Um, this is speaking of a guy named Simeon, okay? And I want to show you a waiter. This is someone who waits. Are you a waiter? <laughs> Waiting is, uh, is very active. We want to be waiters. Now, listen to this language. 
um, if I didn't give it to you, chapter 2, verse 25. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, for the consolation. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. Now, just pause for a minute. I got to give you kind of, this is before Pentecost, perhaps obviously, because that doesn't happen until the book of Acts. We're in the book of Luke. And this just said, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. In other words, listen, this guy, Simeon, you got to get this. This guy, Simeon, is reaching out and he's grabbing something. <clears throat> he's grabbing something before it's time. He's pulling promise in <clears throat> into his day. How's he doing that? Will you notice again with me? It says, um, in the description of this guy, it says he's waiting for the consolation of Israel. Um, what's consolation? You can't make this up. Now listen, consolation, the, uh, the word in this is periclesis. <laughs> I hope you noticed. It's, it's the same root. I'm going to try to pull it together. <laughs> it's tapping my waiting. <laughs> so just bear with me. I'm waiting. <laughs> He's waiting for the periclesis of Israel. Okay, it means comfort, consolation, um, exhortation, entreaty. In other words, intercession. Now, you know the word periclesis means comforter or intercessor. Why intercessor? I want to tell you why. The role of the Holy Spirit, we read it already, is to take what is Jesus's. Jesus takes from the Father and wants to give it to you. So the role of the Holy Spirit is to be that intercessor in the courts to give you the kingdom. Are you following? But how does this man, Simeon, um, tap into that. It's because he's, he's waiting. He's a guy who writhes, twirls, sings before it happened. He's been waiting. <laughs> I'm going to quit reading that verse because every time I, every time I read that verse, I can't, <laughs> I can't finish reading. Um, for the consolation of Israel, for the paraclesis of Israel. And it goes on verse 26, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the, into the temple, and when the parents brought the child Jesus to him, According to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you're letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation. What did his eyes see? They saw Jesus. Now listen to me. This guy Simeon becomes a participant. <laughs> a participant in the weight of glory. How did he do that? He was waiting. He was waiting for this consolation of Israel. He was waiting for, for the paraclesis. Now, <laughs> I better move on because um, I'm going I'm to do something else, really just for my own sake. <laughs> I want to tell you, um, I want to go to Pentecost now, okay? Let's, let's talk about context again. Um, so they are all in one accord. They are what? They're waiting. They're waiting in the upper room. Why? Because he told them to. He said, wait. In fact, you know, this is coming to my mind. I want to read this to you. I think. <laughs> yeah, here we go. This is good. Okay, I'm going to do this first. Then we're going to do that. Thanks for bearing with me. Okay, this is Acts chapter 1. I'm reading in verse 9, okay? So, so Jesus, just before he ascends to sit down at the right hand of the Father, disappears up into the sky while they watch. That's when he says, wait. Don't do anything, just, just wait. Do it in one accord. Gather, gather in an upper room, writhe in pain together, prayer and supplication, and, and wait. Why? Because you're really going to have to be prepared for this. You got it? I love you so much. It's not my desire to crush you. It's my desire to give you the weight of glory that is the promise that you're destined for, but to make sure you're ready for it. So go wait. You see, waiting is a prep. It's a fasting. Okay, but here, verse 9, it says, 
Now, when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? In other words, why are you staring at the sky? <laughs> that's what they're saying. And why are they saying that? Now, that's why I'm, I'm going to read one more line, and then we're going to talk about this. This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven um, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. But now, listen, I want to focus on this. Why do you stand, why are you staring at the sky? I'm going to tell you what they're really saying. Jesus said, go wait. That's an active thing. That's not a twiddle your thumb thing. I'm going to show you really clearly in a minute how we do that. Um, but basically they're saying, why are you standing here staring? You've got something really important and active to do. Quit standing around. Well, you said, what's that? What's, what's the active participation thing that I have to do? Wait? Just wait? <laughs> Is that really it? I want to tell you what happens next, okay? Um, I'm not going to read it. I'm just going to tell you about it. What happens next, they go into the upper room. Okay, they're there and it, um, the, the wisdom of the spirit comes into Peter and he says, hey, you know what, guys, we're 11 instead of 12. Judas dropped out of the mix. Okay, there were 12 tribes in Israel. Jesus called 12 disciples. It was not an accident. It was very much on purpose. Why? 12 is the number of fullness that, that can receive the weight of glory that God wants to pour out. Um, it's the it's the fullness of the number, okay, 12. Peter begins to suggest in that room, what are they doing? Remember, they're waiting, and what does he do? He suggests we've got to fill that 12th role. Now listen, and it, and it goes through, I, I recommend go read it. It's a great way to celebrate Pentecost. Read that whole narrative of the day that the outpouring came. Great exercise, meditate, read it. But uh, I just want you to know that that this is, we pass over it, we don't realize it. This is the example. This is the picture, part of the grand picture that God gave us to define how we are a people of waiting so that we're ready for the outpouring that's coming. You see it? So what's he doing? Now I'm going to tell you what he's doing. Most of you already picked up on it. But he is positioning everything for the coming outpouring. <laughs> Waiting <laughs> is positioning everything for the coming outpouring. Waiting is extremely active. It looks like writhing. It looks like twirling. It looks like um, shouting and singing like we do in our worship before we experience the outcoming, um, the outcome. Waiting is knowing that our God is good for his word. Jesus spoke it, so it's coming. <laughs> those who will participate in its fullness are those who wait. I could have read, read I don't know, hundreds, thousands of verses on those who wait upon the Lord. That's what we're talking about. This is what it looks like. <laughs> Waiting is what positions you. Waiting is the, um, I'm just going to read this. I, the Lord gave me to this. So. Waiting actively positions for the fulfillment of the promise. You see, if those that were crossing the wilderness with the Lord, if, if, uh, if they were promise-focused people, in other words, if they were ate up over what they were waiting for, the entry into the promise that the Lord, why, why was it promise? The Lord spoke it. He said, he said, I want to take you there. I'm taking you there. It was promise. If they were waiting people, they would have walked into the promise. The entire story of that wilderness journey is written to show us that they were not waiting people. 
They kept talking about Egypt. They kept talking about the way it was. They kept grumbling about how it is. They, they were n- never really waiting people who were writhing for the fulfillment of the, what the Lord has spoken, what, what, the, what the lover of my soul wants to give me. <clears throat> We are people that are made to fulfill the destinies of the Lord. Your destiny is to be participant in and receiver of the promise and the outpouring that he wants to bring. Outpouring after outpouring, deeper after deep, until the presence of the Lord is so powerful that his bride is ready. I want the next outpouring. Look, I don't know the Lord's timing. I do know this. I do know there is outpouring after outpouring after outpouring, and I'm in for the next one. And it's a people of waiting. I'm going to close with this thought, okay? Um, <clears throat> the word of the Lord is, is of vital importance. Now, I know you go, duh. <laughs> I get it. That's okay. Just, just permit me to, to talk like this for a moment. I believe when the people of God, and I don't mean like, uh, let me just say this. I don't even mean the church. I'm talking about you. He really, he loves you. When the people of God, when you don't have a word that you're waiting for, you're really in deep trouble. You know why? Um, Whatever comes along will be what will be what you go with. <laughs> okay? Waiting is what positions everything for the fulfillment of a destiny that he has spoken for you. Because he's crazy about you like that. I believe it's it's of critical importance. It is the design of the Lord that you have seeds, you have words that are growing into their fulfillment. You, you have seeds of the Lord that are, that are growing into that fulfillment. Okay, it is a vital of importance to know that you have a word from the Lord and that you are, you are painfully, you are actively arranging everything for the fulfillment of that word. And why do you do that? You do that because you know he's good for his word. The moment the Lord speaks at its promise, now, listen, I know that many of you, and this is the concluding thought, many of you um, probably hear me say that, and you, and you say, well, Pastor, I don't have that experience. <laughs> I don't have this word that you're talking about. I don't have that seed that I can, I can writhe in pain and position everything in my life because I know the Lord's going to fulfill it. I don't have that. So then I've got something very practical. I told you this series would be practical. So here we go. You ready? This is what you do then. Ask him for that. Now look what happened. (laughs) You now have something to wait for. Gotcha. You now have something to wait for. Ask him for that. Lord, I need the seed of that word. I need a word that I know you spoke to me. The fresh breathe. breathe. Jesus said, my words are spirit and they are life. He never stops speaking. He wants to speak to you things that you cannot now bear because we're people who wait. Because people who wait, people who will suffer through that fast of waiting are people that are made into the people that can bear the weight of its fulfillment. But if you got nothing, if you got nothing to wait for, that makes you every day you wake up and you say, today might be the day. I feel the pain of today might be the day. And then tomorrow, well, it wasn't today. Tomorrow might be the day. You you got it every day? If you say, I don't have that experience, I am not writhing in pain over a, over a word spoken because he loves me. And I believe he's going to fulfill it. Then I challenge you, ask him for it. He speaks destinies because you're made for the fulfillment of spoken destinies over your life. Let me pray for you. Father, I ask right now that for those who have already received seeds, words. They already know something personal, something special, something dear to them 
that you have spoken, Lord, that you're, that you're releasing a spirit of waiting over your church in the authority of your name, Jesus. Will you fill that with your spirit, that you make us more and more writhe in the pain over unfulfilled word, increase our hunger. Lord, we invite you to continue to strip off religion <laughs> that creates a false comfort and grant us the disturbing, the wrecking presence of the Holy Spirit that brings us into the genuine real thing. And Lord, for those who, who just now said in their heart, I don't, I don't have that experience, um, I need my own seed. I need my own word from the Lord. Lord, I ask that you would be um, creating a hunger of waiting for people that are just waiting for that initial word. A release in the name of Jesus what you would have them wait for with all of their being. I release in the name of Jesus a spirit, a motivation to begin to arrange their lives, to bring everything into position for the fulfillment of your words. In your name, Jesus, amen. Thank you for coming, Lord. Amen.